Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Now we try to understand the pathophysiology and pathobiology of the diseases involving kidney and urinary system. So the our knowledge of anatomy and physiology of the excretory system that will be the basis to understand the pathobiology of the renal and genitourinary diseases. So for that, uh, let us try to recapitulate some of our earlier knowledge, which we have all learned in the initial classes of anatomy and physiology. But before we do that, just to understand the some of the historical perspective of the renal diseases, I think few of the interesting information I want to give you. Issue is that who gave the first authentic description of the genitourinary system? None other than Leonardo da Vinci and Andres Vesely of Vercelis in 1543. And who described the renal corpuscle? I think many of you know because earlier these renal corpuscles used to be described as these Malfigian corpuscle under the name of Marcelio Marfigi, he is a French physician. Now, the kidney, there are certain basic things we should remember. A newborn, its weight ranges from 13 to 44 grams and it increases in adulthood to 125 to 170 gram in male and 115 to 155 gram in female and this the weight of the kidney is usually proportional to the body surface area. Interestingly, the number of glomeruli is constant in an individual from the birth till adulthood. So, you realize that the from 13 to 44 gram, it increases to almost 170 gram and this increase is due to the expansion of the tubular mass. That means, the huge amount of structural modification has to take place in the kidney just to make it able to do the excretory function as well as other many other important functions which are very important for regulations of blood pressure, electrolyte balance, your the red blood corpuscle productions and so on. Gradually, we will come to those issues when our further classes will go on. Now, the average size of the kidney in adult is 11 to 12 centimeter long and 5 to 7 centimeter wide and it is usually 2.5 to 3 centimeter thick. The remembrance of this dimension is extremely important. You know, in, in any chronic renal disease, the kidney volume shrinks, it decreases and that is why in ultrasound, one of the major issue the physicians try to look is the size of the kidney, whether it is normal or it is shrunken or small. That is why the normal size is very, very important. Now, the kidney is some of these basic statistics will be very important for you to remember. It receives almost 20 to 25 percent of the total output of the heart, huge amount of blood it receives because it has to do excretion or filtration of the blood and it that is why filter almost 170,000 centimeter cube I mean cc of filtrate every day, but then it reabsorbs almost all the water that is almost 1 x liter of water and finally, urine volume is only around 2 liters per day. And during that process, it gets back all the sodium chloride or all the salts and as well as it reclaims 180 gram of glucose every day. So, that is why the renal function for excretion is a very, very specific one and we will try to understand that how kidney maintain this kind of absorption, excretion and other endocrine functions. Now, in our first class, uh, particularly where we try to understand the structure and functional correlation in relation to particular disease. What we will do? We will identify the components of the urinary system. 
and we will try to characterize the general organization of the kidney which is related to the understanding of the disease. To examine the histological structure of the nephron and collecting ducts is a very important because the kidney diseases may be involving only the glomerular system or glomeruli or it can involve only the tubular system. So, all the the pathobiology and the disease process will be very different. So, that is why we must know their structural issues which related to the pathological dysfunction and then obviously, this will lead to our structure and function correlation. Now, so far as you have already read, so not going to the detail, obviously kidney is a very, very vascular organ because it has to take almost one fourth of the total cardiac output for the filtration function and the it is connected to the urinary bladder by the ureter and the urethra finally, and this is the whole organization of this uh, gross anatomical urinary system. I am going to the kidney itself, kidney has got an exocrine per portion which is related to its uh, mainly excretory function and then it has got an endocrine function also. The two most important the hormone produced by kidneys are erythropoietin which is is important for the regulation of the red blood cell formation, other is the renin and all of you know renin is extremely important for maintaining the blood pressure through the renin and angiotensin system and also regulate the blood volume. If you go down to the, the gross structure of the kidney and cut across or cut through one kidney, then you can easily identify the it has got the outermost the renal capsule and followed by uh, there is the cortex and then these are the renal pyramid and in between this portion is the renal medulla. Now, this corticomedullary junction is extremely important. If it can be clearly seen that means, there is hardly any structural damage to the kidney, but in most of the chronic diseases when there is a lot of scar formation and fibrosis, this corticomedullary demarcation become blurred and that is why when you do ultrasound of the kidney, we see the size of the kidney and also see the corticomedullary demarcation in the cut section, ultrasound cut section. And as excretory system goes on, these medullary tips, these open into the renal papilla and these are form this kind of calicial system. These are the major calices and in between there the smaller one may be described as minor calices and they drain into the renal pelvis. From the renal pelvis, obviously, the urine goes into the ureter. As you have uh, already studied in the in the anatomy classes, the, there are other two structure apart from ureter in the renal hilum that is the renal vein and renal artery. Obviously, blood comes through the renal artery and then we will come to that whole vascular system and finally, it comes out through the renal vein. Now, we go down little more to the smaller structures of the component of this kidney. And the unit of this whole excretory system or the kidney is nephron. And the nephron, what are the component of the nephron that you must remember? The, the nephron consists of the uh, renal corpuscles, that is, these are the glomeruli, and then they have got the proximal tubules, and they have got this uh, loop, which is called Henle's loop, and then there is this distal tubule and then they drain into the collecting duct. So, this whole thing like starting from the, the glomeruli and these distal tubules, they form the one nephron and this is the functional unit of the renal system or excretory system. Now, understanding because main function of these each nephron is the filtration. So, what they will filtrate? They will filtrate our blood and produce the ultrafiltrate from the ultrafiltrate after absorbing all these electrolytes and water and glucose and other important molecules, but the final excretion will occur in the urine in the form of urine. So, this whole process that is why it needs a huge amount of the vascular architecture which can maintain this ultrafiltration in a very well for excreting most of the excreted product of the body. That is why you must also understand the vascular network which is present in the kidney. So, that is a very important functional component. 
But from pathological point of view, you must know all size of arteries and vessels rather because veins also are present in the kidney. So, any collagen vascular disease which we will be reading in other classes. So, even in the cardiovascular disease where a particular size of artery like medium size arteries are mostly involved, if it happens to happen kidney may be involved because of that. Similarly, any collagen vascular disease which can involve the small arteries, arterioles and even capillaries that can also affect kidney because it is a highly vascular organ. So, what the conclusion is that that any collagen vascular disease which can involve any size or type of the vessel can also the affect the vessels of the kidney and by which it will become a pathology of the kidney. So, what are the arteries? See the renal artery from there the main branch the comes you have got the um, arcuate artery and for arcuate artery you have got these uh, interlobular uh, arteries and from interlobular arteries it comes to afferent arterioles and afferent arterioles in, in they become the capillary network of the glomeruli and from here it comes out these efferent arteriole and 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 then it obviously goes to this is the arterial system and then they drain finally into the venous system which comes the blood out from the kidney through the renal vein now if we really go deeper into one of the glomeruli it has got a urinary space so it's it's a sac kind of thing and on which this capillary networks are impinges or projects like this and which we saw in the earlier uh, uh, diagram and this the capillary loops consists of 6 to 11 capillary loops and outside these capillary loops there are these podocytes they are specialized epithelial cells which actually maintain the integrity of the glomerular filtration barrier we will come in next slides and also it, it maintain the urinary space so that after the filtration ultra filtrated it is accumulated in this urinary space or Bowman space. The outside of or the parietal layer or wall of this Bowman space is, is, is uh, lined by also podocytes which are we call the parietal epithelial cells or parietal podocytes and those which line in the outside of the capillary loop we tell them they are visceral epithelial cells or visceral layer of podocytes. If we again cut through the cross section of that because this is very important you to understand the structural component of a glomerulus. Then you will understand the what are the glomerular filtration barrier and as well as if in a particular cell type or more than one cell types are affected in a particular disease, what kind of abnormality functional abnormality can occur secondary to that disease. That is why I am going to the in the details and explaining you that what the structural component you should know in the nephron or in the glomerulus. Now, this one if you go through this whole the cut which is a total transverse cut and then you can see that these are the capillary loop and in the capillary loop if the blood is flowing here. So, obviously, the first layer which is formation of this filtration barrier is the endothelial cells and these endothelial cells are all fenestrated in between the endothelium there is a long fenestration we will come to that and below that fenestration there is the glomerular basement membrane. So, that is a continuous barrier, but glomerular basement membrane also is strengthened by the visceral epithelial layer and the visceral epithelial layer will, will also form a part of the glomerular filtration barrier and these are the visceral epithelial cells and then these, these are the urinary space and this is the Bowman's capsule and here it is lined by the parietal epithelial cells. Now, in the hyalur region there is also very important component that is the juxta glomerular apparatus. It consists of the specialized cells in these tubules which are called macula densa and the importance of these that they can sense the glomerular filtration pressure as well as they also control the electrolyte uh, take part in the electrolyte balance. We will come to that just later. So, this component as this is the afferent arteriole and this is the efferent, uh, afferent arteriole, this is the efferent arteriole. So, the blood comes from one of them and goes out one of them uh, through other and hemodynamic pressure maintenance inside the glomerulus is extremely important and which also determines that how much the rate of the glomerular filtration will take place. And all those things are controlled by the renin angiotensin system and as well as 
the sensors which are present in the macular lens. In between these capillary loops, these capillary loops cannot hang, I mean just loosely inside the glomerular. They have to be tightly captured and tightly bound together. And this kind of binding is done by nature by creating these areas in between the capillary loops which are described as mesangium or mesangial areas. In the mesangial areas, the, there are mesangial cells, these are actually modified phagocytic cells and then there are matrix, these are the mesangial matrix. Normally, in one mesangial area, there are up to three mesangial cells normally we can see. If it is more than that, then it is abnormal. But the function of the mesangial cells is obviously create the adequate the structural strength so that the glomerular capillaries can remain um, intact and as well as the filtration function can be maintained. Now, this is the picture of a glomerulus which you can see under the microscope. Now, the schematic diagram if you try to just imagine the same thing is here. I have uh, I am showing you a picture where you can see these red red things, these red things are red blood corpuscles where they will be there, they will be inside the capillary lumen. So, this is you can definitely identify is a capillary lumen and if you see the capillary lumen in between these three capillary lumen, this is the area which is the mesangium and I told you in mesangium there may be one to three cells normally. So, here you can see there are hardly one or two cells. So, this is a normal glomerulus and where you will see the protocyte, they will be outside this capillary loop or this is the like area like this. So, this will be a protocyte. So, protocyte also can be seen under light microscope and this is the Bowman space or urinary space and these flattened cells are basically parietal epithelial cells. So, so this is the structural component as you can see under light microscope in a glomerulus. Now, let us go into details for that we have to do electron microscopy. So, electron microscopy the same thing these structures you can see in details already I have explained this is the part of the red blood cells, this is like a moon and this is the uh, capillary lumen and here are the endothelial cells which are fenestrated. This is the uh, glomerular basement membrane and then these are the protocytes. The protocytes has got another interesting structure which we cannot see by light microscope that is this food processes. So, these are the food processes, they are like your foot and with your shoes on. So, they are all expanded at the tip. In between the two foot processes, they are all joined very tightly by the slit pore membrane. I mean, we will come to that. So, that is the, the main important structural thing which maintain the integrity of the glomerular filtration barrier. So, if there is any damage to the protocyte, what will happen? The slit pore membrane will be abnormal or, or cannot be maintained their integrity. So, there will be loss of these the important component of filtration barrier. So, what will happen? So, obviously, the lot of the, the larger molecule which normally are restricted by this filtration barrier, they will come to the urine. The one of the most important component is the albumin. The albumin is uh, the uh, 68 uh, kilodalton. So, so they, if, if they start coming to the urine, so that indicates that there is any abnormality in the glomerular filtration barrier, most likely the damage to the protocyte. We will come to that how it can happen. So, if, if, if already I have told you, so if we summarize the filtration barrier, it consists of endothelial cells, they have got fenestration size is very big, around 70 to 100 nanometer gap. Then you have a continuous the glomerular basement membrane. Structurally, when we look under electron microscope, we can see that some portion of it is verified and they are subendothelial area. That is why you use the term lamina rara interna. And then there is a middle part which is dense one, we call it lamina densa and then there is external part which is again rarified near the protocyte food process that we call lamina rara externa. But the protocytes we will go in details because that is the most important cell to maintain the integrity of the glomerular filtration barrier. So, they have got this the slit pore, these are the gaps and the filtration slits are in the size of 20 to 30 nanometer. They are not free spaces, they are actually closed by certain molecule. So, the glomerular basement membrane, I what I described the three layer that is the appearance under electron microscope, but you will ask me that what is the composition, I mean what consists of glomerular basement membrane. So, there are type 4 collagen, 
these are the fibrous protein you know collagen is everywhere in the body and then they has to be glued by the other extracellular matrix protein the more important component of the, those are laminin and then polyanionic proteoglycan and other glycoprotein so so main fibrous protein is the type for collagen and along with the other the glue like substances of extracellular matrix protein now this is the larger view or the high power view of the electron microscopy already i have explained to you and this you can really see that this is the endothelial cells these are the big fenestration 70 to 100 nanometer and this is the rarefied area of the lamina rara interna this is the dense area which we call the lamina densa and this is the lamina rara externa and these are the porocyte foot processes in between the foot processes these gaps are the slit pores and this is the cell body of the protocytes so from the capillary lumen the filtration takes place so from here the fluid goes to the sub protocytic space those of you who are interested to know a little more you know the protocytes doesn't have a cells that sitting there idly doing some function they are very intelligent one there is a huge contractile element in each protocytes so when protocyte contracts these are called sub protocytic space the subprotocytic space then decreases and that can increase the hydrostatic pressure on this side of the glomerulus that means the filtration rate can be controlled by protocytes themselves so by their contractile function so that's why the subprotocytic space identification is also sometimes important because subprotocytic pressure can be regulated which is important to regulate urinary glomerular filtration rate at a particular time after this i think let us go to little bit of molecular level because you know the the this time when we were still students many of the things which we were not knowing so for us obviously understanding pathophysiology was much simpler but now we know i told you that there are certain molecules which maintain the barrier of the glomerular filtration or slit pore so what are those molecules that is very important for us to know now because any abnormality of of the genes which particularly produce these molecules or moieties which maintain these glomerular slit slit pore so if there is any any abnormality or defect in the gene then finally slit pore functions will be affected so next question is that to understand that what are the molecule which maintain the slit pore and then what are the molecules which also maintain the contractile function of the protocyte so i think broadly we we can try to remember uh, the initially that uh, uh, the these molecule in these two broad class structural molecule for contractile function and the molecules which are important for maintaining the slit pore so the contractile elements are the actin actin i think all of you know it's a very widely distributed microfilament actin filament and then myosin 2 myosin is there in lot of the muscle but then they are there also in fibroblast and then they are they are also in the protocyte alpha actin in 4 tallin and vinculin so these are actually the contractile element of the protocyte and to form the actin cytoskeleton which is very important to maintain the structural integrity and more important particularly for the abnormality of the protocyte glomerular filtration barrier and protocyte barrier the the genes or the proteins which are responsible are nephrin p cadherin cd2 ap that is cd2 associated protein jdo1 jona octodens uh, protein 1 fat that is the mammalian homolog of drosophila fat protocadherin i think the the names are little big and tricky but you know the initially when they are described the this molecule was described in drosophila that's why still it is mentioned as the nomenclature then protocin and nephrin 1 so so basically nef1 sorry the, the, so basically these are different molecules which are responsible maintenance of the slit pore i think now we can summarize the functions of protocyte i already told you it regulates the glomerular perm selectivity that means the which other molecule can pass and which cannot pass structural support to the glomerular capillary yes they have got contractile element and they have got these protocyte foot processes which structurally support the glomerular capillary in fact the glomerular basement membrane material is added by endothelial cells on the one side and the protocyte from the other side so the glomerular basement membrane remodeling 
is also helped by the protocyte themselves. Then cooperation with the mesangial cells to resist the, the, the distensive force of the intracapillary hydrochloric pressure. I told you that they have to maintain and keep them intact. Say for example, a person has a very high blood pressure. So obviously, afferent arteriole will, efferent arteriole, they will try to control uh, uh, the, the entry of this blood in such a high pressure in the glomerulus and that is why they can maintain the filtration pressure within normal limit. But at the same time, the nature is created in such a way, such kind of the abnormality and surge can be maintained by the both inter interaction between the mesangial cells and the, the protocytes. I have already told you that the uh, glomerular basement demodeling is done by the endothelial mesangial and the protocytes and then endocytosis of the filtered protein also can be done by the protocytes. So, these are the main functions of the protocytes. Now, coming to the, the tubular system, we have got the two types of tubules, one is the proximal tubules and distal tubules which I have shown to you. Proximal tubules have got the large amount of the surface to absorb the lot of molecules, proteins and other moieties. That is why they have got the brush border, while distal tubules do not have brush border and, and obviously in between the tubule you have got these peritubular capillaries. Okay, so that is I think summarize this the, the structure of this kidney in relation to the functions which I have tried to explain. Now we enter into the diseases involving the kidney. Now when we think about diseases involving kidney, what will be the simplistic way to, to classify these diseases from the pathological point of view and to remember them also. So, one way to classify any the group of disease whether we can ask is a congenital disease and or whether acquired disease. So, also but the problem is that the term acquired is too broad. So, so it is very difficult but in kidney also it is true then some diseases are congenital and some diseases are acquired. We can also classify whether the disease is primary versus secondary. Say for example, you have a systemic disease of say autoimmune disease of systemic lupus erythematosus or you have a systemic disease of hypertension. If it involves the kidney, then the kidney damage or disease caused by the hypertension will be secondary disease of the kidney. Whereas, if it is a disease of say glomerulonephritis which only involves the kidney, no other organ, so then obviously we will tell that is a primary disease. Now, we can again try to classify these diseases according to the structures which are involved. And I think from pathological point of view, as we know what are the types of cells are there in the glomerulus, what, what are the components of a glomerulus like glomerular basement membrane and, and the matrix material and other molecule which maintain the slit pore. So, it will be easy for us to classify the disease or understand the disease if we try to understand the structural component of a glomerulus. So, then the big chunk of disease which comes under uh, this is the glomerulonephritis. Now, if I ask you without remembering anything just from the terminology, what do you understand by the term glomerulonephritis? So, I think I think it is very simple, it glomerulus as a part of the nephron. So, nephron means it consists of glomerulus as well as all the tubular system. And then there is a component of itis. Itis in general pathology means inflammation. So, technically, this term is coined long back, I think in 18th century, and that is why this term today is misnomer. That we know that several glomerular disease, there is no inflammatory component, at least known inflammatory component, known, in, known inflammatory component. So, that is why this entity, though it is a standard terminology we are using. But they may not be inflammatory etiology in all these, uh, in all these diseases which comes under glomerulonephritis, and that should be a clear cut understanding. Now, the better term to use is that is why glomerulopathy, but anyway, we do not go into the controversy. So, we will, we will maintain the terminology as glomerulonephritis. Now, next question will be how do we classify glomerulonephritis? Structural classification should be our mainstay. Another very important question is that whether this abnormality is associated with immune complex deposition or not. Because the big group of disease, the glomerular disease is associated with the immune complex deposition. And management wise and as well as understanding of the pathobiology of the glomerular diseases with immune complex deposit is very different from the glomerular diseases 
without even complexity folding. So, that is why it is important for us to know what is the immunological type of this glomerulonephritis and then we will also try to understand if we can identify etiology. So, any secondary glomerulonephritis say for example, a person is suffering from systemic lupus erythematosus that is a systemic autoimmune disease and if the glomerula is involved in that then we know that glomerular involvement is secondary to the systemic lupus erythematosus. So, that is why exploration of this etiology is also very important. So, first I talked about the structural classification. For structural classifications, you have to remember what are the cells which are present in the glomerulus. I think I am again uh, recapitulating for you. This is a very clear cut picture now, better than the last one. And see, this is the these are the uh, glomerular capillary. Inside the capillary, you have got these endothelial cells. And then in between the capillary loop, these are the mesangial area. You have got these mesangial cells. And then outside this, you have got the glomerular basal membrane and then you have got these epithelial cells. Now, if we try to understand the diseases which involve the endothelial and mesangial cells, we can classify them in one kind of disease and then the diseases involve these epithelial cells, we can classify in another type of disease. I will give you the example. Before we enter into that, there are certain other terminology we have to be very clear about. Usually, we when we use the term glomerular nephritis, we call it the diffuse glomerular nephritis or the focal glomerular nephritis. So, what is the meaning of the diffuse and focal? So, the diffuse mean all and focal mean some but not all. Now, the issue is that of what is the percentage? Classically, we say 50 percent. If 50 percent, less than 50 percent glomeruli are involved in a particular biopsy or the samples which you are viewing under microscope, then we call it a focal disease. If it is more than 50 percent or 50 percent above, then we call it a diffuse disease. Similarly, in a glomerulus, I told you there are 6 to 11 capillary loops. So, if less than 50 percent of the capillary loops are involved particular in a particular disease, then we call it a segmental. Whereas, more than 50 percent loops are involved, then we call it global. But the global usually indicate the entire glomerulus. So, here I, I think the rule of 50 percent should not be applied. So, if the entire glomerulus is involved, then we call it global and a portion of the glomerulus is involved, capillary loops, we call it segmental. So, these two terms are very important to remember, diffuse and segmental and focal and global. So, I think concept should be very clear. We use other terms sclerosis and fibrosis. These are basically laying down of collagen and, and which is the senescent phase. After the disease burnt out, obviously, it will be replaced by the fibrosis only. And another term we use is hyalinosis. Now, hyalinosis is, is nothing, it is look like eosinophilic or little red kind of structure under microscope. And many a time, these are interchangeably used sclerosis and hyalinosis, but basically, th there is not much pathological significance for that. It may be a change secondary to degeneration. And we will be using the term necrosis and cell death apoptosis. So, these are the that is why terminology sometimes we will be adding to our the description of the glomerular nephritis. And this is the schematic diagram which explains a diffuse glomerular involvement versus a focal glomerular involvement. I told you that less than 50 percent glomerular involved and this is a the, the black one if it is involved then this is a segmental involvement in a glomerular. So, this is the diffuse focal and segmental. So, this is the glomerular nephritis the term can be further classified by these. Now, coming to, to down to the according to the integrity of these classification, the glomerular disease can cause proliferation of these different cells or it may be not associated with any kind of proliferation. So, that is why structurally we can classify them proliferative glomerular nephritis and non proliferative glomerular nephritis. And under proliferative glomerular nephritis, according to the cell type which is proliferating, we then further sub classify them. If mesangial cells are proliferating, then we can call it mesangial proliferative glomerular nephritis. If the epithelial cells are proliferating, usually they form a crescent like structure. We will show you the photograph later. The moon, which is in the crescentic form kind of structure, and these are caused by the epithelial cell proliferation. And when the endothelial cell proliferation occur, we usually use the term endocapillary cell proliferative glomerular nephritis. But here there is a little bit of caution. 
when there is proliferation of the endothelial cells in a solid looking glomerulus, it is very difficult to differentiate between endothelial cells and the mesangial cells. So, when we use the word endocapillary cell proliferation, mostly we indicate endothelial cells, but there may be also some amount of mesangial cell proliferation. So, anyway, but endocapillary cells are mostly in a situation when you do not see any glomerular capillary lumen, they are all filled bloodless glomeruli and indicating definitely there is endothelial cell proliferation. Then we use another terminology which we usually call membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. Now, this terminology if you remember then you can describe the pathology. The membrane means this is the glomerular vessel membrane, usually they are thickened or they are split, so there is abnormality in the glomerular vessel membrane and the proliferative component come from the mesangial cells. That is why another terminology used to describe this membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis is mesangiocapillary glomerulonephritis and all these proliferative glomerulonephritis can happen diffuse. When we come to the non-proliferative glomerulonephritis, the huge chunk of the younger uh, the patient in childhood, they come with this disease where when we see under microscope, we do not see any disease or changes. So, that is why we describe this kind of glomerulonephritis as minimal change disease or no change disease. I think minimal change disease is more popular term. In abbreviation, we call it MCD, minimal change disease. And then another situation occur where the each of these uh, glomerulus or some of these glomerulus, they can show you the segmental sclerosis. So, obviously, less than 50 percent glomerulus, that is a focal. And the segmental glomerular sclerosis that they are sclerosed. So, this entity is called FSGS, seg focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. So, this is also a non proliferative glomerular disease. And then comes the membranous glomerulonephritis. In these, there is no proliferation, there is only thickening of the glomerular vessel membrane. So, that is why in a non proliferative glomerular disease, these are the three most important entity we will describe or we will learn. Minimal change disease, MCD, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, FSGS and membranous glomerulonephritis or MGN. Immune complex, that is why we have to now see that whether these are associated with immune complex deposits or not. If you see, immune complex deposits are seen, say for example, if it, there is IgA deposit, we tell it is IgA nephropathy. In post-infective glomerulonephritis, we also get certain kind of immune complex deposits. So, we will we'll see it later, but normally, the MCD and FSGS, there is no immune complex deposit. So, that is why that is I told you that study of the immune complex deposit is also very important for further classification. Etiological already I have explained to you, those secondary to systemic disease, they should be diagnosed so that the systemic disease can be uh, treated and, and whereas in primary, they have to be different kind of management. Now, coming down to the, I have already described now the, the structure and then associated with the classification of this disease, particularly pertaining to glomerulus, so glomerular diseases. If we ask that all these, the glomerular diseases which you have classified, how they present clinically. Interestingly, even there can be thousands of permutation combination of the structural, uh, the issues and with the immunological immune complex deposit or the immune complex deposit, there are only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 clinical presentation or clinical syndrome and that is why it is very important for the clinician also to understand exactly what structural and immunological abnormality is happening. Otherwise, it is very difficult to diagnose these cases. So, the cases can be present as acute nephritic syndrome, rapidly progressive pneumonephritis, nephrotic syndrome, chronic renal failure or asymptomatic hematuria and proteinuria. So, these are these the the five syndrome with all the renal diseases will present. Now, acute nephritic syndrome, the typically you have to remember they present with hematuria, the azotemia, the mild to moderate proteinuria, there may be lowering of the urinary volume, which we described as oliguria, even sometimes rarely there can be anuria, but then that is more common in, in RP, RPGN and there will be the edema, particularly uh, the puffiness of around the eyes and hypertension. So, this is typically the syndrome of acute nephritic syndrome and the commonest cause is the post infective glomerulonephritis. Then comes the entity of the rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. The rapidly progressive term is, is very important for you to understand. Usually short history, 
with with few days to weeks, and it, they present with the uh, sometimes the oliguria or anuria. There is almost no urine, and there is uh, if there is urine, then there will be mild proteinuria, and there can be hematuria also. So this entity usually progress very rapidly and causing causes acute renal failure. So this entity, this in, this group of glomerular disease, that's why grouped under rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis or glomerular diseases. Then comes the nephrotic syndrome. A large number of patients actually present with the nephrotic syndrome. Usually there is a heavy proteinuria. This proteinuria is important. It should be more than 3.5 gram. And there will be hypoalbuminemia. So your serum albumin level, level has to be estimated. And there is usually hyperlipidemia manifested by high increase in cholesterol level and it may or may not be associated with lipiduria. So this is the major problem of this disease is massive proteinuria. Then comes chronic renal failure. Obviously, this is a long history and gradually increase in the serum creatinine and blood urea level and this can result with any chronic renal diseases. And then there is another entity where the patient can come with the asymptomatic hematuria and or mild proteinuria. So these has to be investigated in a different way, but all the diseases which I have structurally classified, they can present only in one of these five group which clinical syndrome I have described. Now the next question is that, say for example, we are dealing with a post-infective glomerulonephritis. So can it present in more than one type of clinical syndrome? Yes. So any structural uh, type of glomerulonephritis can present with more either of the, the one or two or different kind of the clinical syndrome. That is why it is very important to understand the clinical pathological correlation in diagnosis of this renal diseases or glomerular diseases particularly. Now, to diagnose that what routinely we do, I am just giving you some idea because in your many of the courses you will be trying to understand that how do you come into a particular diagnosis. I have already described you the different steps and different requirement, but how do you arrive at that. So, we get usually needle biopsies from the kidney. This is a nowadays a painless procedure by these ultrasound guided gun, use of gun. And uh, after that, we, we uh, fix the tissue in 10% uh, formalin for light microscopy examination. We also put a little bit of tissue in the immunofluorescence fluid to do the immunofluorescence test. And then we put in the electron microscopy fixative. I showed you that electron microscopy photographs are very helpful for us to see the protocyte abnormality, which we cannot see under light microscope. Protocyte food process, if you have to see, it has to be done electron microscope. So that is why I think it is important and there are several diseases where EM is necessary. And for the formalin fixed tissue, we do the paraffin section and we do the histology and immunohistochemistry if it is needed. And for the tissue which we have kept for immunofluorescence, we do the immunofluorescence microscope to see that what are the type of immune complex or immunoglobulin it is deposited there, component of the complement and all those things and then whether this immune complex or immunoglobulin is monoclonal or polyclonal. So all these things we try to, to see under immunofluorescence test and obviously electron microscope we see to see the ultrastructural changes. The normally we do the routine stain, uh, the hematoxylinicin stain we do for light microscopy, uh, for general evolution and cellular characterization. And if there is inflammation, then we try to see that whether it is a neutrophil or whether they are lymphocytes. So, type of inflammatory cell can be detected easily by hematoxylinicin stain. Then we do the PAS stain, that is pyridic acid sip stain, to see the basement membrane very, very clearly because hematoxylinicin does not show you very clear view of the glomerular basement membrane, where PAS stain does that. So, that is why we do it. So, so this gives the basement membrane of the what are the structure in the kidney where which have basement membrane? You, you have got the glomeruli, they have basement membrane, tubule, they have basement membrane, and all the blood vessels they will have some basement membrane. So, obviously, we will see them, and mesangial matrix also can be easily stained by the pass. So, we will see the mesangial matrix area. Then we do the silver methanamine stain. Now, this is this gives you the details of the collagen which is there in the glomerular basement membrane. And then sometimes we do the mason trichrome to assess the fibrosis. Then we, we also sometimes do the Congo red and Cyrus red stain. Congo red is done to detect the amyloid. Now, <clears throat> when we see these kidney biopsies under microscope, we try to see the changes in the four compartments. Because you, we have to see all the changes and then try to come to a conclusion 
that these changes are secondary to involvement of which component of the glomerulus or the kidney itself. So, we see the glomerular compartment, tubules, interstitium and blood vessels. These are the four compartments. I told you that many of the diseases can involve the blood vessels primarily, but that can involve our kidney. So, if I look, if we look into these four compartments separately, then our detection of these abnormalities are much better. Now, for immunophosis microscopy, the uh, what are the immune complex deposit we look for? We look for IgG. These are the different kind of immunoglobulin: IgG, IgM, IgA. These are the three immunoglobulin. We try to see whether they are deposited or not, and then also we try to see whether they are monoclonal or polyclonal. For that, we use the kappa and lambda. So these are basically antibody raised against these components so that they can be detected. Then we also try to see that whether there is activation of this classical pathway of complement system or alternative pathway of complement system. So, for that for classical pathway we do C1Q and for alternative pathway we do C3. Sometimes also we do C4, but not routinely. So, these are all different complement components. This helps us to understand how, what are the way the complement system is getting activated. And sometimes we do fibrinogen, particularly if there is a acute inflammation in the glomeruli, there is a lot of fibrinogen positivity. Rarely we do the uh, the other like transferrin thing, but then these are the main thing you should remember. And and then we can get the deposit of this immune complex. Then we try to characterize where they are deposited in the glomerulus and pattern of deposit. If they may be linear or they may be granular, and they can be also in tubular basal membrane. So these are the some of the example. Like here, if you see. These the bright, the greenish uh, yellow deposits. These are you can. They are all granular. Whereas these, if you see, they are all linear deposit in the glomerular capillary basal membrane. And is a combine of the uh, both blotchy large deposit, granular deposit. So basically, they are combined. So basically, these are the pattern of the immune complex deposit you can see. And uh, so this is the immunofluorescence. And going to the electron microscopy, if you see the abnormality, you can see that say. For example, there is a huge loss of the, this is the normal basal membrane, you can see the porocytes and where there is a thick basal membrane with lot of collagenization. But I think so, at the end of this talk, what we have uh, really described or learned is that we have gone through the, the uh, gross anatomy of the kidney, then you come to narrow down to the, the, uh, the structure of the nephron, we went down to the electron microscopic level to understand their ultrastructural detail. Then I came down to the molecular level to understand the glomerular filtration barrier, how, what are the molecules which are responsible for that. And finally, we go on that how do we examine the kidney biopsy and what are the tests we do, light microscopy, immunofluorescence and electron microscopy. And then we also discussed about the classification of the glomerular disease on the basis of their morphology or structure. I think that summarizes the, the initial talk or the class about the general discussion and understanding of the glomerular disease.